From Cambridge, Massachusetts, WHDH Radio News and Public Affairs present the Harvard Law School Forum, another in the series of informed discussions of current affairs. Tonight, recorded highlights of the topic, Area Contracts and the Teamsters. The guest speaker is Jimmy Hoffa, president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And the panel includes John T. Dunlop, chairman, Department of Economics, professor of labor economics, Harvard University, and John R. Meyer, the professor of economics, School of Public Administration, Harvard University. The moderator is Derek Bach, professor of labor law, Harvard Law School. Now here's the main speaker, Jimmy Hoffa. Chairman Goldie, Professor Bach, gentlemen, ladies, it's an extreme pleasure to come here tonight and be able to tell you the factual situation concerning the Teamsters International Union. Not the fictional situation as you have read, viewed on TV and listened to on radio. Many of you smiled and I noticed shifted when the Professor Bach mentioned about appearances between the government agencies. It is true that this international union is a strong, militant organization. An organization and a key position in American industry. An organization that is the largest single labor union in the world. An average of a million and a half odd members with a total membership of a million seven hundred thousand members. This international union is comprised of 17 trade divisions, an executive board of 15 individuals, 13 vice presidents, secretary treasurer, and international president. This international union has divided the entire United States into four sections, having what is known as a Western Conference beyond the Rocky Mountains, a Southern Conference in the 10 Southern States, the Central States Conference in the Middle West, and the Eastern Conference, each one of those conferences being headed up by a vice president under the direction and control of the executive board of this international union. In addition to those conference areas, we have 45 joint councils. Those joint councils are strategically located around the United States in various states, so all the local unions in their vicinity, near vicinity, belong to the council, pay a per capita tax, and is a self-governing body within the confines of the Constitution of the International Union. In addition to that, the 17 trade divisions, each one have a trade division director. That trade division director lays out the organizing program, assists in organizing, assists in negotiating, and help to adjust disputes in his particular division. Our international union is a firm believer that we must have area-wide contracts. We must have company-wide contracts in industries that are in more than one city, one state, anywhere in the United States. We have tried since the year of 1935 to educate our local unions to the acceptance of area-wide contracts, which has been rather difficult because under our president, Daniel J. Tobin, born here in Boston and president for 45 years with International Union, joint councils were the autonomous body within the international unions and set the policy for their area. As we graduated from the Joint Council area into the conference area, it became necessary to have individuals who are strong leaders in their own rights, many instances having joint councils with membership as large as international unions have in their entire United States. As an example, we have 165,000 members in New York City. We have 147,000 in Chicago. We have 140,000 in Los Angeles. We have many joint councils of 85,000 throughout the United States. Each one of those individuals had to first accept the theory of collective bargaining by area practice. It became necessary to have the membership re-educated. 
into understanding the need for collective bargaining on a wide range area rather than on a local union basis. And this was difficult because the local unions in New York, where they are strongly organized, well financed, believed that they were able to take care of their own problems. And their wage scales, their hours, and their conditions were self-sufficient to themselves. But as the over-the-road trucking came into the scene, as the intricate highway system of the United States developed, more and more it became necessary to recognize that a high wage scale in New York merely meant that the drivers coming up out of Carolina, somewhere in Pennsylvania or somewhere in upper New York, would come into New York and back out at a lesser wage scale breaking down the conditions of the drivers and warehousemen who were so completely organized and satisfied in New York. 1935, after a very long discussion with our executive board, many of which were ingrained with the old-fashioned idea of individualism and joint councils, with an average age of 65 on our executive board, it was very difficult to convince them what we could foresee in the future. Finally, through the wisdom of our president, we are authorized to start negotiating the area-wide contracts and the principle of area-wide and company-wide bargaining. And from the year 1935 up to the year of 1961, contracts were negotiated across this country by states, multi-states, areas, and finally in the year of 1961, we were successful in negotiating a nationwide collective bargaining contract for the first time. A contract that covers all of the transcontinental transportation of America by truck, the interstate carriers, the intrastate carriers, the city cartage, and the docks that went with those trucking companies. Where today, after all the long years of convincing our unions to go along, they have voluntarily, through their membership voting, they accepted the theory of a master nationwide contract. And today we are the one international union that has by signed contract established a minimum fringe benefits for our members across the United States, established a minimum health and welfare, pension plans, and wage scales and guarantees. Where in the year of 1964, all the contracts will expire we will sit down and negotiate as the now contract provides for one single contract in the United States covering approximately quarter of a million or three quarters of a million workers. All of this has brought about much controversy. Brought about the question of introduction of legislation. One of the present controversial pieces of legislation being discussed by radio, TV, and by those who don't understand the what they're talking about is the question of the piggyback, which many of you have read about as a method of extracting money from the employers per trailer for some reason. And very cleverly, it has been hidden to the fact that this was a negotiated program, a negotiated and accepted clause in a collective bargaining contract. Where when our pension plans were placed into effect, we allowed for a 15% turnover. And as the so-called piggyback movement of trailers on flat cars, as containerization of freight took place, the 15% dropped down to 7, which affected the collection and necessarily actuarial study of the pension plan. And so it became necessary in 61 to take in consideration either a reduction in pensions or the rearrangement of the contribution to the fund. We made an alternative to the proposal to the companies, one that they accept 50 cents per week payment on all employees in the industry or a $5 charge on each trailer where it was being moved by some means other than tractor trailer. The employers themselves in their own meetings voted to accept the alternative of the five dollars. Yet today we find that five states, with 
individual legislators on the floor ranting and roaring about the fact that this was improper, unlawful, and a past state law. And again, you come into the question of area-wide bargaining when that takes place. Our meeting in Chicago this week, we decided on the course that we would follow, filed an unfair labor practice with the labor board rather than strike, recognizing the fact that once the board accepts the jurisdiction of the unfair labor practice charge, it takes it out from underneath the State Legislative Act passed to prohibit the $5 contribution for piggy bank and laying the groundwork then for a successful legal fight in the court to be able to show that the state laws cannot obstruct the federal law's passage of Taft-Hartley and the Wagner labor law. Our international union has been under scrutiny and surveillance for a long time. Many of you have enjoyed the almost seemingly fictional pictures that have appeared in the newspapers, TV, and the live programs from the Senate hearings. There you witnessed men coming from all over the United States by subpoena, bringing their books, their records, and attempting to sit there and recall from memory what may have happened four, five, or ten, or fifteen years ago. Many of them not desiring to rely upon their memory sought the protection of the Fifth Amendment. And this became a great to-do in the United States. As though it was a sin or a crime to exercise a constitutional privilege of an American citizen. After all those long months of TV and all the wild barrage of publicity, it finally settled down into the courts. When it settled down into the courts, the right of cross-examination write a proper presentation of your case and preparation of your case to skilled lawyers. Almost in every instance, those individuals are found innocent and clear to the charge. Yet we find now, in my particular case, the case in New York that you've read about last week, we find that a new ruse has been established by the McClellan Committee. As many of you students sitting here probably never will again read of or have knowledge of unless I tell you. Because I am sure it will not be taught in the classroom nor spoken in the classroom. And I am sure it will not be publicized by TV, radio, or the press. To the effect that when the trial was set in Orlando, Florida, our lawyers decided upon a plan of strategy we subpoenaed the records, books, and the individuals who represented that committee that had condemned this international union for three long years and requested that they come forth and produce their evidence, produce their records. I gave them right to make the statements they were making. And yet we found the very day of the subpoena returnable that they conveniently rushed in front of the United States Senate of America and had a resolution passed and placed the great seal of the United States on that resolution where they said, and I will only read one part, this is subject to be taken to your classroom because I will leave it here if you decide, the desire to discuss it at your leisure. <laughs> where it stated resolved, United States Senator John L. McClellan has granted leave in his discretion to respond to the aforementioned subpoena, to testify in any matter determined by the court to be material and relevant for the purpose of identification of any document or documents provided said documents or documents have previously been made available to the general public. Without prejudice to his rights, based on the privilege of the United States Senate, to respectfully decline to testify concerning any and all matters acquired by him in his official capacity, either by reason of documents and papers appearing in the files of said subcommittee, or by virtue of conversation or communications in any person or persons. And so we find for the first time in this country the accusations uttered publicly 
now become a private sanctuary for senators to hide behind a resolution where they now fail to come into court and give individuals in the Teamsters unions a right of cross-examination by proper legal counsel, the production of records, to be able to set aside this fantasy that the Teamsters Union is a corrupt organization or controlled by the underworld. And so we find in the year of 1962 that it's convenient for those who would shout the loudest those who would wage the war within labor unions will now conveniently hide behind a Senate resolution. And so this international union, recognizing those problems, have not hesitated all during the past three years of one of the most complex problems that ever faced an international union. The question when I was elected in 1957 in Miami, Florida, a rebellious group of individuals in New York went into the federal court. Out of that case came monitors, a word never before issued or used in a court procedure. Those monitors became the watchdog of the Teamsters Union for three long years at the cost of three and a half million dollars to our union. And after three and a half years, the court released the monitors, authorized a new election, the convention was called again, delegates elected by secret ballot in accordance with the federal law, the Landon Griffin law that they so probably talked about. And yet when those delegates went down to Florida and had a free discussion on the floor, the announcement in the press was that they were suffocated with democracy. And so you must recognize that if you are a strong militant union, that becomes involved in every single organizing campaign in the United States, becomes involved in every single strike in the United States, whether we like it or not, because transportation flowing to and from industry involves us into all disputes. We constantly are in the limelight, to no fault of our own. But we are not a bit concerned, because we have never hesitated to use the strike weapon. This international union was built by men like Dan Tobin here in Boston. If you read the story, you will find what happened here. Our organization believes that we must, each contract period, increase the wages, the hours, the conditions of the men we represent. Taken in consideration, the increased desire to have a better living for themselves, their families, and taking in consideration that they are united into this union for the protection of themselves as well as recognizing their responsibility to the public. And so when we have four and a half million unemployed in this country, and we have probably another four and a half million working part-time in this country, we find the greatest industry in the world, the steel industry, freezing wages. And yet we find that on the West Coast, the Maritime Union is on strike because they cannot agree to a contract. And we find that the government more and more is moving into this question of labor relations, which we believe is very disastrous to the employers and to the unions. Because when an outsider, a third party, enters into the negotiations, almost always one side or the other or both sides. But the force of the entire government will be required to give in, to compromise their position, to avoid being criticized by the press and by those who only understand what is printed or told of them by TV. We are organizing not only the transportation, we are in the industrial field. We are organizing the plants such as Sikorsky, Honeywell in Minneapolis, many large industrial organizations, organizing the airline industry, organizing the industries that are in everyday dealing in commodities and warehousing and giant food chains across this country. Last year, we participated 
in the last quarter of the year are one out of every four elections in the United States. And there's 179 international units. In the white-collar field, we participated in one out of every three elections in the last three months of 61. And so we are a rapidly growing organization, expanding with the economy of the country as the population grows, and there's more needs for transportation, keeping in mind the responsibility of having an industry that's healthy, and yet recognizing that we have a right to believe that we are entitled to the increases that we negotiate each contract period. There is one thing we pride ourselves upon, and that is the fact that if we make a good deal, we keep it. If we make a bad deal, we keep it. We do not allow our unions, once they have signed the contract, to have illegal strikes. We do not allow individuals to try and abrogate agreements by subterfuge. When that happens, we immediately take action, and we correct the situation so it doesn't reappear. Because there can be no satisfactory, there can be no satisfactory relationship between a union and an employer unless the employer recognizes that he has a right to come to the bargaining table with his ideas. We have a right to come to the bargaining table with our ideas. And we sit there and negotiate. But once we have arrived at a contract, neither side has a right to do other than to live to that contract for the duration. Any mistakes we made, we'll correct the next contract. Any mistakes the employer made, he has a right to present and correct at the next contract. <laughs> we have averaged the membership of an average of a million and a half. We average each month no more than 2,500 to 3,000 people on strike and our 900 local unions, which is a very minimum loss of man hours and productivity. We expedite each contract that becomes involved in trouble by experts going in and trying to resolve the issue. But in many instances, we have found now the necessity of having this extended negotiations of master contracts because of the secondary boycott, which we'll discuss here tonight. And the secondary boycott, more and more, is making the unions of America destroy each other like cannibals. Because when there is a strike of an auto plant, under the law today, Teamsters unions do not have a right to instruct their members not to go through that picket line. But each individual must make up his own mind individually whether or not he should. They are now trying to hold, and we are in court litigating it, the question of even having the right to negotiate a contract to protect a man's job who does not desire to go through a picket line. Now, this continues on with all of the adverse decisions of the court and the labor board. The unions of America, in my opinion, will find themselves in a position of the European unions when they pass oppressive law of having to take industry action, industry strikes on a large-scale basis to be able to compete with the restrictive legislation. I have advocated a transportation unity. Headlines by the hundreds and articles by the thousands have been written about. And even some of the good professors, probably having read it repeatedly, were confused with it. The fact that all we're seeking is a council, not to take all railroad, air, land, and sea into one union, but to have the organizations that are currently organized in their own organizations brought into a council. So we will quit competing with each other by individual negotiations and negotiate a contract rather than contracts so we will not have a pattern of strikes each one trying to escalate the wage increase beyond the last contract signed, as we see on the West Coast today. And so by and large, I say to you that the Teamsters International Union, with its 3,000 full-time organizers in the field, are rapidly becoming 
organized in all sections of the country in transportation. Many difficulties are arising in the South in the right to work states. By the same token, we have sufficient legal talent, sufficient understanding of the industry, and as they pass laws, men that are desire to have the better things of life will find ways to negotiate provisions that will give them the necessary protections to get those conditions. We have on our staff a large number of lawyers, some 400-odd lawyers. Throughout the United States. Those lawyers, from time to time, are supplemented by local counsel. And I would say to you that they're more busy today than they ever were in the history of any period of labor movement. <laughs> I would say to you, in closing, that the labor movement today is worse off politically than it was in 1932. Because of the divided and the divisions of the legislative action of organized labor, we have allowed laws to be passed by supposedly friends that we supported in elections. <laughs> that have almost brought about the destruction of a cohesive, well-organized labor movement that they had been dreamed of when the Wagner labor law was passed. We are confident, in a matter of time, the Teamsters Union will be back in the AFL-CIO. Many may ask why. It would cost $4 million for us to join the AFL-CIO a year. We believe that the increasing need of collective political action necessitates ourselves being back in the Federation. I would say that for the first time in the history of this international union, our convention passed a resolution dealing with political action. And we are establishing in the international union a division of political action. We are establishing a ladies' auxiliary in each council in the United States and a men's auxiliary in the United States, where we will go into grassroots politics on the same methodical basis we did in organizing our Teamsters Union. Those who seek to destroy us will be properly advertised to our members and our friends <laughs> to try and convince the working people of the communities. Unless they do the same thing collectively as they did in collective bargaining, what they gained across the table, they will lose by the stroke of a pen of a McClellan or individuals such as him. And so I would say in closing that we recognize our responsibility as Teamsters to the communities we work in. We do not believe, though, that a democracy can afford to sacrifice the individual rights of American citizens from taking collective action for their benefit, even though it may temporarily inconvenience the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffa. We have as our first panelist this evening, Professor John R. Meyer of Harvard University. Professor Meyer received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Washington University in 1950, his PhD in 1955 from Harvard, and has been at Harvard as a professor of economics since 1955. Like most representatives of Litauer, he has served on in numerous or innumerable committees and public bodies and has written a great many books, articles. Of particular importance tonight, I think, is the fact that he has specialized in the field of transportation, which qualifies him very obviously to comment, as he will do now, on uh, what Mr. Hoffa has just said. So I give you now Professor John Meyer. Uh, 
as just explained by the moderator, I'm an economist. And originally, I intended primarily asking economic questions. In fact, eventually, I may end up asking mainly economic questions. However, I am perplexed about one point, legal point, in Mr. Hoffa's presentation. So I'd like to pose one simple question that I'm sure no lawyer would pose. I pose this to Mr. Hoffa on the grounds that he knows more lawyers than I do. He's had more experience with them. <laughs> and he can make what appears to be an inconsistency to a naive layman like me uh, quite consistent. 